Ethiopians are an unwarlike people. Ethiopia is open for business not only for colony of smiths, carpenters, masons and surgeons but also start-up technology companies and foreign direct investments in all sectors of its economy. But Ethiopia is absolutely closed for the business of meddling in its internal affairs, lies and disinformation and sanctions and threats of punitive measures by self-appointed caretakers of Ethiopia. Ethiopia, a country with glorious history and culture of 3,000 years. Hello families of Ethiopia today. Welcome to your channel. Our today's presentation focuses on civilization of Ethiopia written by Professor Alameo Gebermarian, where he argues on clash of civilizations between Ethiopia and America at the crossroad. This is a very fascinating commentary, and we encourage you to stay with us till the end, and please also like and share the video and help us reach out to more audience as much we can. First-time visitors don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Then you won't miss out very important and the exciting videos we bring to you. You can also support our works by donating via our website, www.ethiopiatodayofficial.org slash donate. Let's get into the presentation. Theory of Clash of Civilizations in a seminal 1993 article, later expanded into a book, Professor Samuel Huntington argued future wars and conflict will be fought not between countries but between civilizations. Huntington was responding to Francis Fukuyama's contention in a 1998 article, later parlayed into a book, The End of History and the Last Man. Fukuyama argued the world had reached the end of history in a Hegelian sense, that is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution. Hegel's conception of history postulated a dialectal progression towards the consciousness of freedom. He believed each generation struggles to become more and more free, until eventually a perfectly rational society of freedom is achieved. For Hegel, 18th century Prussian constitutional monarchy was the end of history. Fukuyama argued capitalist liberal democracy was the end of history because it had successfully removed the internal contradictions that had ruptured past schemes for ordering society. Under capitalism, advancements in science had produced technological innovation and military competition, urbanization and bureaucratization which had maximized productive efficiency and satisfied man's desire for material wealth. Fukuyama believed capitalism met the material needs of mankind while liberal democracy satisfied the universal human desire for recognition by merit and achievement. Fukuyama suggested human rights, liberal democracy, and the capitalist free market economy are the only remaining ideological alternatives for nations of the world in the post-Cold War world. Huntington shares Fukuyama's view that the age of ideology had ended with the old war period. But Huntington argued ideological conflict will be replaced by cultural, civilizational, conflict. That is because cultural identity shall become the core of civilizations in conflict. Huntington's conception of clash of civilizations puts the old Western world history revolving around the struggles between monarchs, nations and ideologies on its head. In a clash of civilizations, non-Western civilizations resist and will only critically accept elements of Western values into their civilizations. They will assert their position on the global stage as equal actors, just like the West, capable of shaping and moving world history. Huntington proposes other core arguments in expounding his hypotheses of the clash of civilizations. First, the Western belief in the universality of the West's values and insistence on Western-style democratization is not only outdated but a recipe for antagonism and conflict with non-Western civilizations. Second, non-Western civilizations will increasingly resist and refuse to accept the structure of the international system, including the UN, built and maintained to preserve the West's dominant status quo. As Exhibit A, on December 8, 2021, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed tweeted, I join other African leaders in reiterating that a continent of around 1.3 billion people needs a permanent voice and seat at the UN Security Council represented through a bloc. Issues and decisions that concern the continent cannot continue being addressed without continental representation. Africans are claiming our place in the sun. 
Thirdly, there will be major shifts of economic, military, and political power from the West to the other civilizations, specifically challenger civilizations, manifestly China. Clash of Civilizations in Ethiopia-US Relations Ethiopia is a civilization, not a country. What is happening in the relationship between Ethiopia and the US is a clash of civilizations. It is a clash between a civilization founded on white European supremacy and an African civilization deeply rooted in black independency. The United States of America was born on June 21, 1788 when its constitution became the official framework of the government of the United States of America after New Hampshire became the ninth of 13 states to ratify it. Ethiopia, the cradle of humankind, has existed since time immemorial. The US wants to divide Ethiopia ethnically and control its destiny. Ethiopians responded to US imperial and neo-colonial ambitions with total defiance and heroic audacity as they always have when faced with white supremacy. They responded with steadfast unity and proved to the world united they will never be defeated by white supremacy civilization. They proved it in 1896 and 1941 and now. Ethiopia today is the tip of the spear and steel shield in confronting white supremacy brazenly bearing its neo-colonial and imperialist fangs at the African continent. Today the world is witnessing a titanic struggle, a David vs Goliath contest between a small and ancient civilization that sustains itself on pride dignity and sovereignty and a superpower civilization driven mad by a toxic doctrine of global hegemony as its manifest destiny. Ethiopian civilization today is the African battleground in the struggle between white supremacy, conspiracy, belligerency, idiocy and lunacy on the one hand, and black African primacy, independency, democracy, resiliency, prophesy and decency, on the other. Ethiopians value personal dignity and national sovereignty above life itself. That is why they have always defeated white supremacy and kept their nation free and independent for over 3,000 years. In defending their dignity and sovereignty against an imperialist, neo-colonial proxy war, Ethiopians from all part of the country, from shoeshine boys to old women in their 80s, volunteered by the hundreds of thousands to fight against the US-sponsored terrorist TPLF. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers who begged to join were turned back totally disappointed because the Ethiopian National Defense Force could not accommodate them. America's proxy terrorist warriors, the TPLF had to force families to turn over one child at gunpoint and use child soldiers as part of its human wave military strategy making so many cannon fodder. Ethiopia remained free of white colonial rule because every Ethiopian man, woman and child was prepared to lay down their lives to defend their country. The US, after nearly 125 years of bilateral relations with Ethiopia does not know Ethiopians. Now, it does. There are two types of Ethiopians. A few that are willing to sell Ethiopia for 30 pieces of silver and 115 million who are ready to die for Ethiopia 30 times over. The US thought the real Ethiopians were the ones willing to sell Ethiopia for 30 pieces of silver. What a monumental blunder. Ethiopians believe their country is one of the oldest civilizations on Earth. Ethiopians believe they are unique and exceptional because they have never been colonized by white Europeans. Indeed, the Europeans who tried to colonize them got their behinds kicked, badly. The United States of America was created in 1788 and is only 234 years old. America is a young civilization and a land of immigrants. America's constitution is a great charter of liberty writ large against tyranny. As a civilization, Ethiopians see themselves as having a way of life unlike any others. I have often written about Ethiopian exceptionalism to convey the idea that Ethiopia has certain unique and positive qualities that make it different from other nations in the world, but in no way better or superior to any others. That exceptionalism is best expressed in the verse Ethiopia shall rise written by the great pan-Africanist and first president of Ghana Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah described Ethiopia as Africa's bright gem, land of the wise, the bold cradle of Africa's ancient rule and as Africa's hopes and destiny. Beyond Africa, 
Ethiopia is the cradle of humanity. So says the Smithsonian and backs it up with irrefutable archaeological evidence. Ethiopia may well deserve the title cradle of humankind. Some of the most famous, most iconic hominid fossils have been discovered within the country's borders. Ethiopia can claim many firsts in the hominid record book, including first stone tools and the first Homo sapiens, I mean exceptional not only in the grand things of life such as the cradle of humankind. I also mean exceptional in the ordinary things of life. A reporter for The Mail and Guardian who visited Ethiopia in May 2018 yearned for a speedy return, but the thing to return for with the greatest urgency is the country's hospitable people. It is as though Ethiopians have been schooled in being pleasant. Coupled with their sense of humility is a stirring physical beauty. Their humility, hospitality and beauty make Ethiopians exceptionally civilized people. Ethiopian exceptionalism also in matters great for human civilization. But for the Aksumite king who welcomed persecuted Muslims, protected and refused to return them to their persecutors, Islam may not have survived. The Aksumite king assured the survival of Islam as a religion. The Aksumite kings of Ethiopia minted gold coins around 270 CE to conduct international trade and were big players on trade taking place on the Indian Ocean. Ethiopia was the first civilization anywhere to use the cross of Christ on its coins around 330 CE, long before the Romans. During the first Hijra, the Prophet Muhammad directed his persecuted followers to leave Mecca and seek sanctuary in Abyssinia, Ethiopia ruled by a Christian king, well known for being a just and God-fearing man. Ethiopia is one of the few countries in the world, where Christians and Muslims have lived side by side with mutual respect and appreciation for hundreds of years. That is true even today despite the relentless efforts of domestic and foreign conspirators to create sectarian strife between members of the two religions. How about Ethiopia's Christian civilization? Ethiopia has a special place in the Old Testament. Few are aware that Ethiopia is the first country mentioned in the Old Testament. And the name of the second river is Gion, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. Genesis chapter 2 verse 13, King James Version. The river Gion is none other than Abai River in Ethiopia. Foreigners call Abai, the Nile. It is on the river Gion that Ethiopia today is building its grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. The Ethiopian Bible is the oldest and most complete Bible on earth written in the ancient language of Gears, which is still used today in the liturgies of the Ethiopian Tahado Coptic Orthodox Church. The Ethiopian Bible is nearly 800 years older than the King James Version and contains over 100 books compared to 66 of the Protestant Bible. Ethiopia is mentioned at least 38 times in the Bible. In the book of Psalms chapter 68 verse 31 is written, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. God always lifts those who stretch their hands to him. As far as I can ascertain, there are no European countries that are mentioned in the Bible except for Greece and Rome in the epistles. The eleven medieval monolithic Christian churches of Lalabella in Ethiopia built in the 13th century as the New Jerusalem are a marvel of human ingenuity. The Lalabella churches were hewn from solid blocks of rock with doors, windows, columns and roofs meticulously carved out and complemented with an extensive system of drainage ditches, trenches and ceremonial passages. UNESCO described the Lalabella churches as a gigantic accomplishment in engineering and architecture. In December 2019, a team of archaeologists uncovered in Ethiopia the oldest known Christian church in sub-Saharan Africa, dating back to about the same time when Roman Emperor Constantine the first legalized Christianity in 313 CE and then converted on his deathbed in 337 CE. Ethiopia had a highly sophisticated system of governance and administration long before America was conceived. Indeed, when the English baron slapped King John with the Magna Carta, arguably the legal foundation for modern Western legal systems, in 1215 demanding that he subordinate himself to the law of the land, rule of law, Ethiopian kings were practicing the rule of law in the Fitahana Nagest in 1240, 547 years before the US Constitution was written 1787. 
The Fitaha Negist remained Ethiopia's constitution and supreme law of the land until it was replaced by the 1931 Constitution of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the only country in Africa with its own complete indigenous written alphabet and numerals and the only actively used native African writing system, still in use after 2000 years with a syllabary of some 500 letters. Ethiopia has its own calendar with 13 months. Ethiopia has its own native unique food grain unavailable anywhere else in the world. Some audacious Western companies even tried to patent it through biopiracy. Ethiopia was the only African country to sit on equal terms with the great powers of the world and became an original signatory to the Covenant of the League of Nations in 1922. His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie was the only world leader to address the League of Nations in June 1936 when Italy invaded Ethiopia. After the European countries turned a deaf ear to his pleas, he said, it is us today. It will be you tomorrow. Three years later, the Nazi war machine began gobbling up Europe. Between 1936 to 1941 during the Italian occupation of Ethiopia, Ethiopia did not have a national leader. The people and their local leaders waged the struggle against the Italian colonial enemy on their own. They did all of the heavy lifting against the Italian colonial army until His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie returned in 1941 simply amazing. Ethiopia was the only African country to sign the UN Charter in 1945. Ethiopia was the only African country to become an original signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the Geneva Conventions in 1948. Ethiopia was the principal architect of the Organization of African Union in 1963 which established its headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. In his autobiography, Nelson Mandela wrote Ethiopia has always held a special place in my own imagination and the prospect of visiting, attracted me more strongly than a trip to France, England and America combined. I felt I would be visiting my own genesis, unearthing the roots of what made me an African. Ethiopia defeated the mighty Italian army on March 1, 1896 in a battle that lasted for one half day but reported as lasting two days. Emperor Menelik II's victory at Ardwa has been described as one of the great military campaigns of modern history. Italy's defeat sent tectonic shockwaves throughout Europe, how can barefooted African savages vanquish a modern European army in just a few hours? Menelik, befitting the great Ethiopian civilization, did not mistreat the Italian prisoners of Ardwa war. He pardoned and sent them back to Italy. That was how the war on savage Ethiopia by civilized Italy ended. The Battle of Ardwa marked a watershed in the unraveling of European colonial exploitation and domination of Africa. Ardwa became a symbol not only for liberation throughout colonial Africa but also for African-American liberation. To summarize, Ethiopia stood in for Africa as a whole, Ardwa fused this symbolic Ethiopia with a contemporary Ethiopian state in the minds and hearts of the African diaspora. It produced and proliferated a particular idea of Ethiopia in pan-Africanist thought, one that saw Ethiopia as the vestige of black freedom in a world where black people, whether in the Americas, Europe, or Africa, were subject to racial domination and exploitation. Indeed. At the first Pan-African Conference in 1900, where W.E.B. Du Bois uttered his famous statement that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, delegates declared the Ethiopian emperor a great protector of African peoples everywhere. Ethiopia defeated Italy again in 1941. Even in matters of daily life, Ethiopia's contribution as a civilization is enormous. Coffee that courses in the bloodstreams of billions of humans every day in every nook and cranny of the planet originated in the Kafar region of Ethiopia. Ethiopian Airlines, established in 1945 when nearly all of Africa was under colonial rule, is the premier carrier unrivaled in Africa for efficiency and operational success, turning profits for almost all the years of its existence. When airlines of the world were shut down by COVID, on February 6, 2021, Ethiopian Airlines carried the first COVID-19 vaccine shipment to Africa. Ethiopian Airlines became the first responder for COVID in Africa. 
When the world was gripped in fear with COVID lurking everywhere, it was the courageous pilots and employees of Ethiopian Airlines who laid their lives on the line and became Africa's and the world's first responder. In February 2020, Ethiopian Airlines delivered the first COVID-19 vaccine shipment to Africa. In April 2020, Ethiopian Airlines transported 3.5 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine from Shanghai to Sao Paulo, Brazil and saved lives. Ethiopian Airlines won multiple prestigious awards. Ethiopian Airlines, the largest aviation group in Africa, has been named the winner of four awards at the Skytrax 2022 World Airline Awards at a ceremony held in London on 23, September 2022. Ethiopian has taken the crown for Best Airline in Africa 2022 for fifth consecutive years. Best Business Class Airline in Africa 2022 for fourth consecutive years. Best Economy Class Airline in Africa 2022 for fourth consecutive years and Best Business Class Onboard Catering in Africa. Moving an incredible 11 ranks up, Ethiopian has also been placed 26th in the world's top 100 airlines for 2022 as voted by airline customers around the world. Simply put, Ethiopian civilization operates in its own time and space. Ethiopia is a different civilization. Ethiopia is a civilization that holds a special place in the hearts and minds of all Africans. Destroy Ethiopian civilization and you will have destroyed African civilization. Divide Ethiopia and you will have divided Africa. Cripple Ethiopia and you will have crippled Africa. Pull the plug on Ethiopia and the dark continent will be enveloped in darkness once again. That is why I believe the US and the EU and Western media will do everything they can to make Ethiopia their imperial, neo-colonial battleground in Africa. But with the Almighty on her side, it shall prevail. Ethiopia Invictus, unconquerable. Africa Invictus. Ethiopia free. Africa free. Ethiopia victorious. Africa victorious. Clash of white supremacy versus black independency on the African continent. If the Biden administration wants to understand how Ethiopians feel about America today, it must understand that Ethiopians view Ethiopian-US relations as a bitter struggle between white supremacy and black independency. US mistreatment of Ethiopia, its arrogance and hubris in trying to restore the TPLF and neo-colonize Ethiopia, its contempt-filled orders to provide unfettered access, negotiate with the TPLF without preconditions, etc. are perceived by all Ethiopians as a manifestation of white supremacy in Ethiopia. White supremacy in Ethiopia has a unique history in Ethiopia. The Austrian Nazi Roman Prohaska in his brief 1936 book, Same Year Italy Invaded Ethiopia, Abyssinia, The Powder Barrel, a book on the most burning question of the day bitterly described Ethiopians' utter contempt for white supremacy. Prohaska's basic argument in his book was that Europe should deal with Ethiopia, to choose a contemporary phrase, like a s-whole African country. Prohaska launches an angry attack on Ethiopians that predates the vilification of Jews in Germany in the late 1930s. Prohaska describes Ethiopians as vermin-ridden illiterates afflicted by some of the worst vices of humanity. Prohaska proclaims, The chief traits of the moral character of the Abyssinians are indolence, drunkenness, irresponsibility, a high degree of dissoluteness, perfidy, a thieving tendency, superstition, stupidly proud selfishness, great skill in deception, ingratitude, impudence in demanding gratuities, and a degree of mendacity worthy of becoming proverbial. Prohaska vents, the Abyssinians are a people without desire for knowledge or love of learning, and incapable of comprehending that what you are trying to do is for their good. What they want is a share of your possessions, and nothing else. He prescribes the only way to keep Ethiopia under European rule and prevent her from threatening European interests in Africa was to divide her along ethnic, tribal, linguistic and regional lines. Prohaska was the first person ever to propose the idea of self-determination as a means to dismantle Ethiopia not so much by military operations as by constant efforts towards establishing a friendly understanding with the border tribes and by proclaiming development, free of all barbaric oppression, 
under the rule of the native chiefs. Prahaska's final solution for Ethiopia, the present Ethiopian empire is not fit and will presumably for many decades to come not be fit to develop or follow a policy of its own, and that to allow it to attempt to do so would be counter to the interests of all civilized nations and would seriously endanger the peace of the world. Having dehumanized, demonized, denigrated and vilified Ethiopians, Prohaska simply could not figure out how vermin-ridden and barbaric people could be filled with so much self-confidence and audacity to believe white people are inferior to them. Prohaska was deeply offended by the ostentatious self-pride of the stupendously conceited Ethiopians and angered by their defiance and contempt for white people. Prohaska lamented, as soon as the white man sets foot in the last sovereign native state of Africa, the foreigner realizes that he is not treated as an esteemed or welcome guest. In the country of the conquering lion of Judah the white man is looked upon merely as a tolerated alien. He is being looked upon with less and less regard as time goes on, not without a measure of blame being due to the various white inhabitants of Abyssinia. It is hardly possible to imagine a more unhappy situation for a white man than to have to live under the oppression of an Abyssinian grandee. Everyone then feels entitled to look down on him and to treat him as they like, and he finally sinks to a condition of moral abjectness, robbed even of despair. The last source of strength left to human being. There are Greeks and Armenians that have been living for a long time in Abyssinia in this hopeless condition, a picture of utter misery to the human observer. Prohaska bitterly complains about discrimination, mistreatment and abuse of white people by Ethiopians. He is outraged by the fact that whites have a lower status than domestic servants and are legally precluded from property ownership. He complained. Under Abyssinian law, a white man is not allowed to acquire property in real estate but remains entirely at the mercy of the arbitrariness and usual chicanery of the landlord or house owner whose property he is obliged to lease or rent. In his dealings with his servants, the European may not in any respect make the same claims or apply the same very necessary punishments, as the native. Prohaska claims ordinary Ethiopians are totally disrespectful and contemptuous of whites. He is outraged Ethiopians treat whites like dogs. It is common for natives to utter invectives at passing white men and women without the slightest reason and generally with impunity. The words koshasha and ferenjwusha or nechwusha, dirty dog and dog of a foreigner or white dog, are often the first words of the Amharic language a foreign traveler hears. Among the Abyssinians the word nech meaning white is a common term of abuse. The reason being probably that the white face is in some way associated with the painful white light of the glaring tropical sun and is therefore instinctively an object of dislike. Discrimination against whites by Ethiopians is visible everywhere according to Prohaska. Even in the train which takes him from Djibouti in French Somaliland to Addis Ababa, the white man has to pay the highest prices and a multiple of the fare charged to the natives. He is indignant over the fact that the Abyssinian grandees, nobility, who spread themselves out in an overbearing manner with their often filthy and vermin-ridden clothing, in the first and second classes, are the lords in the land, and that there can be no question of the foreigner having equal rights with the native, still less of his being in any way entitled to preferential treatment. Prohaska also complains of legal discrimination in the way the rights of whites are subordinated to the lowliest Ethiopian citizen. It is a principle that is universally observed in Abyssinia, to mete out judgment with two different measures. Natives who assault white people generally go unpunished, and many of them escape. But if ever a foreigner makes use of the right accorded to him by law to administer corporal punishment to his Abyssinian employees who cannot be kept in hand for long by patient treatment and warnings alone, he is at once hailed before the court. Every Abyssinian has a deep-rooted conviction of the superiority of the Abyssinian soldier and army over the armies of the European colonizing powers of whose importance, size, and population the average Abyssinian has but the vaguest conceptions, and this conviction is strengthened of course by the memory of the Battle of Adawa, 1896. Ethiopians had utter contempt for white supremacy 86 years ago when Prohaska wrote his little book and that contempt remains intact today. Today the US is offering the Ethiopian people and their leaders of Ethiopia the Prohaska prescription.
they must submit to white supremacy and surrender their sovereignty or they shall perish in a blitzkrieg of sanctions, economic warfare, global disinformation and campaign of demonization. Prahaska wrote, The leaders of the Ethiopian Empire have to choose between either at last fitting in with a system of European influence in Africa, willingly serving cultural progress and civilization by loyal cooperation with the white peoples, or, urged on by senseless resentment and racial mania, carrying to extremes a disastrous policy which can merely exaggerate all the causes of antagonism between the colored and the white peoples and thus lead to a poisoning of the international atmosphere, to the serious detriment of civilized and peaceable progress in the world. Nothing but the dominion of white races can maintain order and security in Africa, and ensure progress and development in the native population. To establish and to strengthen this dominion is work done in the service of world peace. The threatening signs of a colored rising in all parts of Africa call urgently for decisive action. The other face of Ethiopians. When America declared independence in 1776, Edward Gibbon, the great historian of Western civilization wrote of the need to defend the Ethiopians, then called Abyssinians, an unwarlike people from the barbarians who ravaged the inland country and the Turks and Arabs who advanced from the sea coast in more formidable array. Gibbon wrote the Abyssinians were interested in a rational project of importing the arts and ingenuity of Europe, and their ambassadors at Rome and Lisbon were instructed to solicit a colony of smiths, carpenters, tilers, masons, printers, surgeons, and physicians, for the use of their country. In 1896, Rome did not send a colony of smiths. Rome sent a colonial army to subjugate Ethiopia. That colonial army suffered ignominious defeat at the Battle of Ardwa. Gibbon was right. Ethiopians have always been about three things. Peace, prosperity and progress. America using homegrown terrorists to fight its proxy neo-colonial war in Ethiopia. America once threatened to send its Red Dragon military force to invade Ethiopia. The outcome of American imperial and neo-colonial ambitions will be no different than Italy's in 1896 and 1936. Defeat at the hands of patriotic Ethiopians. But the US should know Ethiopians are an unwarlike people. Ethiopia is open for business not only for colony of smiths carpenters, masons and surgeons but also start-up technology companies and foreign direct investments in all sectors of its economy. But Ethiopia is absolutely closed for the business of meddling in its internal affairs, lies and disinformation and sanctions and threats of punitive measures by self-appointed caretakers of Ethiopia. Ethiopia today is a beacon of peace, prosperity and progress in the Horn of Africa and all of Africa. Ethiopia is led by Abiy Ahmed, the 2019 Nobel Peace Laureate, the 100th person to receive the award since the establishment of the prize in 1895, the same year colonial Italy declared war on Ethiopia and was defeated at the Battle of Ardua in 1896. Ethiopia is constantly looking for opportunities to strengthen peaceful relations with its neighbors, the US and all countries who respect its integrity and sovereignty. Ethiopia knows its peace cannot be preserved if her neighbors are at war. In August 2019, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed played a central role in bringing together different factions of the Sudanese government to a power-sharing agreement preventing civil war in Sudan. Ethiopia has an army of peace, not war. The TPLF declared war on Ethiopia. The Ethiopian National Defense Force ENDF, is an army that is never the aggressor but a defender against unjust wars. The ENDF did not go into Tigray to occupy or impose its rule. The ENDF went into Tigray for the single purpose of enforcing the law, to apprehend and bring to justice the leaders of the criminal insurrection that attacked the Northern Command and to establish peace and uphold and enforce the rule of law. The world is witnessing a clash of civilizations in Ethiopia-US relations. I believe the massive outrage expressed by Ethiopians in the country and in the diaspora against the US is a manifestation of Ethiopian civilization culturally asserting itself and its values against Biden's misguided imperialism and neo-colonialism. Huntington was right. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, 
Ethiopians believe they are a beacon of hope and prosperity for Africa and have a strong role to play in the Horn region and beyond. The rise of Ethiopia with China, the alliance between Ethiopian civilization and Chinese civilization is perceived by the Biden administration as a significant threat to the historic hegemony of America and the West, in Africa in general. In the clash of civilizations, Ethiopian-US relations will continue to deteriorate. Simultaneously, the affinity between Ethiopian and Chinese civilizations will continue to become stronger. That is the mandate of history. Within the framework of Huntington's clash of civilization, Ethiopia and China as non-Western societies share common goals of economic development. The US has deprived Ethiopia of a choice anyway. China offers a welcome embrace to Ethiopia as the US tries to break Ethiopia's back with its childish and vindictively punitive sanctions, global disinformation campaigns and state-sponsored terrorism on behalf of the TPLF. I regret to say there are few areas of cooperation left between Ethiopia and the US. Very few indeed. Ethiopians no longer share the Biden administration's concern for human rights, democracy, good governance, etc. They view them all as crocodile songs to justify meddling in Ethiopia's internal affairs and Trojan horses for implementation of its imperialist and neo-colonialist ambitions. On December 9, 2021, Biden opened his summit for democracy. Talking about democracy once Biden said, we have fewer democracies in the world today than we did 15 years ago. Fewer, not more. Fewer. But how democratic is the US? According to World Population Review, the US did not even make the top 10 cut of democratic countries in the world. The US was dropped from full democracy in 2016 to flawed democracy in 2020. Ethiopia was not invited to Biden's demo hypocrisy party. What a magnificent way Biden has chosen to increase the number of democracies in the world. I am not sure Ethiopia would have attended Biden's democracy dog and pony show had it been invited. Suffice it to say, Ethiopia a year ago had an election certified by the African Union as free and fair. Not a single shot was fired during or immediately after the election. A rare event in Africa. But as Biden points an accusatory finger at Ethiopia, he fails to see three fingers are pointing at him and at American democracy which is in deep crises. The November 2020 presidential election is still being litigated in American state courts. Republicans in state legislatures are using redistricting to disenfranchise African Americans and other minorities. Restrictive laws are passed in many American states aimed at suppressing and diluting the voting power of people of color in America. Ethiopia rejects Western universalism, the view that all civilizations should adopt Western values. Ethiopia has its own civilization consciousness about human rights, democracy, etc to borrow Huntington's phrase. Ethiopia has its own identity which transcends Western values. Let's face it. Times have changed. Non-Western countries are increasingly showing they have the desire, the will and the resources to shape the world in non-Western ways. The US must accept the fact that the future of Ethiopia and Africa and non-Western world will not pivot on the central axis of Western hegemony. The increasing power of non-Western civilizations will define the future of global politics and economics. Ethiopia and the US at the crossroad. Still time to mend fences between Ethiopia and the US. It is best for the US to reassess its relations with Ethiopia and restructure its relations by understanding the cultural fundamentals of Ethiopian civilization built on personal dignity and national sovereignty. Bob Dylan said, when you ain't got nothing, you ain't got nothing to lose. Ethiopia, compared to America is poor and some may feel it ain't got nothing to lose. But Ethiopia has something more valuable than all the money in the world. Dignity and sovereignty. Without dignity and sovereignty, neither a person nor a nation has anything of value. I say to the Biden administration, let's mend fences before it is too, too late. Let's bury the hatchet and the TPLF together and on that graveyard build a harmony of civilizations. 
let's not cast to the east wind relations built over 120 years. We can get along as equals, as sovereigns and as peoples with shared goals for the good of humanity. The ball is in Biden's court. He can play a game of chicken little and chicken brinksmanship and try to plunge Ethiopia into economic and political turmoil. That, like all of the intrigues and conspiracies the US has undertaken over the past two years to sabotage Ethiopia, will fail. Ethiopian, on whose behalf the great historian of Western civilization Gibbon testified are an unwarlike people who are interested in a rational project of importing the arts and ingenuity of Europe, and their ambassadors at Rome and Lisbon were instructed to solicit a colony of smiths, carpenters, tilers, masons, printers, surgeons, and physicians, for the use of their country. Change Europe to America and Gibbon's description holds true today. As I have said time and again, there is no power on earth that can stop Ethiopia from taking its rightful place in the African sun. There is no need Ethiopia-US relations should remain in the darkness because of the intrigues and wicked schemes of Susan Rice. Hope springs eternal in the human breast, man never is, but always to be blessed. In my own verse, Ethiopia is a land of dignity. America a land of liberty. We can come together in unity. After all, Ethiopia is the cradle of humanity. America must respect Ethiopia's sovereignty. Treat its citizens with respect and dignity. It is the only way to avoid enmity and live in beautiful mutuality. Ethiopians don't need no white supremacy. They will die to maintain their independency. Ethiopians are committed to human rights and democracy, but not the kind enforced by white supremacy. Two great civilizations can live together. Inequality and sovereignty as sister and brother. Ethiopia, the cradle of humanity, America land of the brave and fraternity, we can partner together in dignity. Postscript. Many American friends have asked me about my sudden and radical change of views on US foreign policy. They ask me you spent so much of your time doing grassroots advocacy in Congress and writing about American democracy and defending its constitution. Why have you become so bitter? Righteous indignation should not be misconstrued as bitterness. America was a beacon of liberty to me. I once cherished it as the last best hope of humanity. When the Biden administration cast its fate with the terrorist TPLF, I knew I could not save the last best hope of humanity which has chosen the path of insanity. Then, I cast my fate to uphold my Ethiopian dignity. I, an immigrant who lived in America for over one half century defended its constitution in the courts of the land with pride and dignity and taught tens of thousands of young Americans in the intricacies of American constitutional democracy yet had barely lived 18 years in Ethiopia when caught in a clash of civilizations and forced to choose, I chose my Ethiopian dignity over my American liberty. It is a choice I never imagined I would have to make. But I gladly chose my Ethiopian dignity over my American liberty because I was born and raised in a great civilization, a society that placed personal dignity and national sovereignty above life itself. I could not help it. A nation plagued by poverty may be rich, infinitely rich in dignity while a nation wallowing in prosperity may suffer a poverty of dignity. The great Miguel de Cervantes, author of Don Quixote, arguably the world's best work of fiction, said, a man without dignity is worse than dead. I say, a life without dignity, like Socrates' unexamined life, is not worth living. When the Biden administration stood with the TPLF and prosecuted its proxy war on Ethiopia, it spat on my face, let me be crude, pissed on my dignity. The very dignity that is in my genes. I am righteously indignant, but not bitter against America. I love America just as much as I love Ethiopia. I am lucky to have Ethiopia and America as a mother. If the US Constitution represents the essence and greatness of America, then for my unflagging defense of the Constitution, even in the face of the equal protection of the law mandate of the Constitution being mangled and distorted and denied to people of color in America, I shall be considered among the leading Americans alive. Truth be told, 
I am bitter against the Biden administration who is manipulated to do wrong in Ethiopia by the Princess of Darkness Susan Rice. The Biden administration, manipulated by Susan Rice has degraded the dignity and sovereignty of Ethiopia, the cradle of humanity. Phylogeny determines progeny. Dignity is the one common gene in the Ethiopian genome. Sovereignty is the one common gene in the Ethiopian body politics genome. A man or a woman has dignity. A nation's dignity is its sovereignty. Susan Rice and her gang of four refuse to acknowledge Ethiopia is a land and a civilization of dignity whose citizens will defend with their lives their country's sovereignty. What a pity! Susan Rice's gang of four has no clue Ethiopia is a civilization, not a country. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said, Truth is with us. We shall be victorious. Because we do our work armed with the truth, the God of Ethiopia will help us. To that, I will only add the Almighty will make our enemies our footstools. By Professor Alameo Geba Mariam. Professor Alameo teaches political science at California State University San Bernardino. He is the senior editor of the International Journal of Ethiopian Studies, a leading scholarly journal on Ethiopia. This brings to the end of our presentation. Thanks for staying with us. Don't forget to like, share, post your comments, and subscribe to our channel. Let's work with the algorithm of the platform. These are the ways you can support our channel to continue producing this and similar contents. You can also support our works by donating via our website, www.ethiopiatodayofficial.org slash donate. May God bless Ethiopia and its people. Thanks again.